Welcome back. House Republican leaders, they beat back an effort from their right flank here to include even more drastic spending cuts than those already contained in Budget Chairman Paul Ryan's budget proposal. Now, the budget that was presented by the Republican Study Committee, it would have balanced the budget in five years rather than 10 like Ryan's, but in order to get there, they plan to raise Social Security age to 70, cut Medicare benefits, plan would have also frozen Medicaid and Children's Health Insurance Program funding at fiscal 2012 levels. The plan had failed as anticipated. It's considered too extreme even by many Republicans on the Hill. So in the end, it's the Ryan plan that stands. Well, today, the House narrowly approved the plan on largely party line votes, 221 to 100, uh, to, I'm sorry, 207. Now, the budget, it doesn't have the force of law, obviously, but it does outline the Republicans plan on how to reduce the deficit and how to overhaul Medicare in the process. No Democrats, not a single one voted for the plan. Plan similar to the two previous budgets authored by Mr. Ryan and one of the most controversial parts of the budget is the fundamental overhaul when it comes to Medicare which would turn it into a premium support system for Americans 55 and up. Now the plan, it raises no new revenues and even cuts the corporate tax rate. It also protects the Pentagon from cuts altogether while slashing deeper into accounts that fund domestic agencies like FBI, National Institute of Health. Senate budget, authored by Democrats, it's more tame. It employs about $1 trillion in spending cuts and $1 trillion in new revenues gained by closing tax loopholes. Also emphasizes job growth and infrastructure spending rather than balancing the budget. Now also today, the House approved a federal spending bill that would keep the government funded through September 30th. Hallelujah, averting a government shutdown. Now, for the first, for those, excuse me, who see the Ryan budget as nothing more than austerity, we ask the basic question, does austerity work? And I, I know we're going to debate the definition of austerity, that in a second. Now, for more on that, let's bring in our new panelists. We're joined by Jamie Modoud, a professor of economics at Sarah Lawrence University. He, one of more than 300 economists, who signed a statement called Jobs and Growth, Not Austerity. Thank you very much for joining us. I Thank appreciate you. it. Now, I know you guys had a pretty lively debate in the green room over the definition of austerity, but... Um, Give me an idea, because it's not like we have to divine out of thin air um, would austerity work or not. We've seen it play out. We've seen it play out in the ballot box and in practical terms, Greece, Cyprus most recently. We saw in England. Um, candidate elected on it, and now recent elections saying the public doesn't like it. What is causing the most amount of consternation here? Balancing budgets, people do it with their uh, own household accounts every time. Why not tighten belts in tough ways and tough times? Well, uh, government spending, cuts in government spending would probably be one commonly accepted definition of an austerity program. And uh, the issue is that in an economic crisis where you have a slowdown of primarily business investment, um, if you cut government spending even more, uh, what you're going to do is you're going to reduce sales and you're going to lead, that'll lead to layoffs, which would lead to a fall in wages and consumption and thereby aggravating the problems of effective demand. So it doesn't follow, and I'm not one of these people who would say that <laughs> the budget deficit can be anything. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's quite right. But uh, surely there are sensible ways by which certain kinds of government spending can be increased. Uh, so for example, we have a major infrastructure crisis in this country. If you look at the American Society of Civil Engineers annual report card on the state of uh, the infrastructure it's in this country. It's very scary reading. It's They're saying plus. bridges could collapse plus, here. Yeah. And, uh, so, there's, so in other words, one could have a jobs program, right? One could have a jobs program uh, which doesn't involve paying people to stare at the sky, but actually involves targeted you know, fixing Just one quick lines. thing I want to bring Mark in is, is have we learned anything for what's going on in Europe um, since they've tried plans uh, maybe more austere or less austere than what Ryan proposed? Have we learned any kind of uh, test lessons from those uh, cases? Okay. Well the, well, the issue is that I think if you look at all the scholarly work that's been done on austerity programs in Europe and elsewhere, uh, primarily as proposed by the International Monetary Fund, the general consensus in the scholarly literature is that they have not worked. And there's a very good reason why. The reason is quite simply because uh, if you cut spending in an economic crisis, 
you're not going to have an increase in productivity growth. You're not going to have an increase in investment, mm. at least not for a while. Now, eventually it may kick in, but as John Maynard Keynes said, in the long term, we're all dead anyway. So it may happen after a while, but who knows how long that would be. So, Mark, I know it's, it, to a lot of people at home, it has an inverse logic. You got, um, your, de your deficits are running high, you're going to spend more. But is there enough empirical evidence to say, if you do cut here with an ax, not a scalpel, you're going to see unemployment go up, um, and you're going to have a more harmful effect when the economy's finally starting to turn around. There's so much we have to cover. I'll try and say it in <laughs> short, it, but we've never done austerity. What's going on in Europe right now is they're raising taxes. They're not touching spending. Spending is going up or, or flatline. They're raising taxes. That's not austerity. Let's redefine austerity. In America, what would, should we do? I'm, a, I'm not one of those ideological people who says we shouldn't ever do prime the pump Keynesianism. But prime the pump should be a year or two. We've been doing Keynesianism for decades. We've never actually reduced spending. It, our spending goes up and up and up. It's been deficit spending all along the way. It's been inflationary spending all the way. We're in the largest credit bubble in history. And I think you would agree, we're still in the credit bubble. We have over 200 trillion of federal, state, and local debt, unfunded liabilities, net present value, over 200 trillion. We are in a crisis right now. So Keynesianism, priming the pump, where our credit is up here. Our credit in, in the market right now is 58 trillion, total credit in the, in, the, in the US market. You can't go any further on that. So all of this, uh, and, and, and I'm sorry, when you say uh, 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 Ryan is austere, he wants to have government growth go at over 3%. The alternative by Obama is over 5%. Growth, all right? Our, you know what our, the growth of the economy was last year? 1.7%. So what that means is our, okay, Ryan's well, plan. The argument a lot of people said, in every business you can find, you can always find 5% that you can cut, okay? And it's not gonna cripple the business. Uh, now, people I think fairly can say to Mr. Ryan, how come defense is exempt here? How we, why are you now selectively, the very thing that you and, by the way, uh, Mitt Romney campaigned on in closing tax loopholes is now off the table, but let's keep facts out of this, I guess. But <laughs> my, my point, though, is can't you cut 3 to 5% out of every department and you're not going to have petulance and famine? Well, look, it, uh, the, the issue here is on what are you cutting. That's really the question. In other words, in other words um, one has to use... A one has to be pragmatic, uh, and one has to also be real in terms of the social crisis that we face in this country, in terms of poverty, in terms of a whole range of other uh, issues connected to unemployment, long-term unemployment, right? So when you're cutting, what do you know is going to be the longer-term consequence of that? I mean, we're talking long-term over here, right? Now, if you take, for example, something like, uh, uh, and there's a, a plenty of empirical evidence of this, uh, that infrastructure spending in terms of the impact of infrastructure on productivity and so on, these are longer term cumulative processes, right? These are not just short term Keynesian types of uh, issues, they're also- But what do you say to Mark who says, all right, when? When do you start to try and get uh, your economic house in order? If not now, when? Okay, let me just say something here which I think is, is an issue and that's a big difference between us and I think that a big difference between those of us who are opposed to austerity is that public debt is not the same as private debt. Yeah. It's not the same, okay? Uh, public debt to the extent where it is denominated in a foreign currency, at least part of it, then you can say that the government is gonna run out of money, just like you and I, if we keep on deficit spending. Mm -hmm. But to the extent where public debt is in your own currency, but which you know what he's going to say. You know, Chinese hold half our debt know. here. At some point, they're going to say America's not a good debt. No, no. uh, along with their empty cities, that there are the assets behind that debt. But the point here is that there is a gray area over here. That's the issue, I think. Which is that, and I think we would agree that uh, that there's a gray area in the sense that you may hit some limit at some undefined point in the future. You don't know when that precise point is, I, think, I don't think anybody does. But in the meantime, by, in, by increasing cuts, you may actually be creating longer term but deleterious let me, consequences. Let me, ask, let me ask you, Ryan, in terms of 
you've looked at some of the proposed cuts uh, that Mr. Ryan's <laughs> laid out here. Um, do you think the public would not only feel it, but touch it enough? W would it be able to be tangible enough if these cuts, which they're not going to become law, pr the president's not going to sign. But my point is, when does it become, wait a minute, this is affecting me in a real way, a real tangible way right now. We don't want 50 kids in the classroom. We don't want, you know, grandma here, uh, you know, uh, eating dog food. I mean, when does, when does it become tangible? I think when, if it starts to really affect the, the middle class and the upper classes, that's when you see the political will to do something, right? I mean, if, if, if his cuts are just going to, to cut poor people off HIV meds or cut, uh, you know, uh, uh, women and women from getting enough food for their children, you know, those are people without political power. You know, th that nothing will happen there. But if, 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 if the cuts actually do send 50 kids to a classroom in a nice high school that people pay a lot of money to live near, then you're going to start to see, you know, m middle class people uh, uh, making noise about these. I mean, there's the issue, too, which is that part of these, uh, the, the so-called Ryan budget is cuts in food stamps, for example, right? Um, Medicaid. Uh, these are going to put, I mean, as it is, we have a severe problem of, un of unemployment poverty in this country, right? I mean, if you take, for example,